Welcome to Reading the Bible Together, and today we're in Genesis chapter 15, and the way this chapter is written reminds us in places of how we're in a very different age and cultural setting than that in which Abram lived. We shouldn't be surprised by this. The text is relating stories from 4,000 years ago in a land and a culture far removed from our own. But the only reason we're surprised is because so much of the Bible relates, so much of that which the Bible relates regarding the human condition is so very timeless. We see ourselves and our families, our systems and our world reflected so vibrantly in so many of the Bible stories. But then along comes a chapter 15 and suddenly we're strangers in a strange land. Let's take a look at the text and see what I mean. It begins with a message from God assuring Abraham of God's continued blessing. And by now we see a pattern after every one of Abram's righteous acts or examples of obedience, God reiterates the covenant. God is teaching Abraham all about the blessings of faithfulness, and Abram is responding with significant spiritual growth and development. Remember that Abram has just given generously to the priest Melchizedek and has refused to prosper from the hand of the king of Salem. And so God replies with this. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Now, astonishingly, in what would become yet another pattern, Abraham enters into a discussion with God. God is giving promises, but Abram wants assurances and answers. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is my servant Eleazar of Damascus? Now, Eleazar is the chief among Abram's staff. He's his, his right-hand man. And as such, he's in line to take over the household upon the childless Abram's death. Now, this might seem curious to us, but recently discovered ancient tablets from Mesopotamia, the region from which Abram first came, show that it was a well-established practice in Abram's day for childless individuals to adopt someone, even a slave or a servant, as a son. He would then have all the attendant duties and rights of a natural son and heir. And it looks like Eleazar of Damascus is in line for, for such an inheritance. Now, what's interesting is that Lot, whom Abram went to such lengths to rescue, Abram's nephew Lot, is no longer regarded as part of the line of succession. It appears as though, while still regarding Lot as a kinsman to whom he has obligations, Abram sees no future in Lot. This apparently has been made clear. Now, in a passage which reads like a conversation between two friends, God responds to Abram's concerns regarding Eleazar by making the promise clear. He says, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. I remember thinking about this verse when I was in the, in the desert, uh, well in behind Masada in the area of the Dead Sea. And no artificial lighting around at all. I was at a Bedouin encampment uh, very late at night. And the stars, I have never seen so many stars so shall your offspring be. Well, now comes a line very important to the foundation of the Christian theology of justification by faith, the cornerstone of Protestant belief. We read, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now the Apostle Paul takes this up in his letter to the Romans repeatedly, quoting this very verse. It is our faith, our belief in the promises of God, which brings us to salvation. The good works that we do, we do in response to our faith in God, but it's our belief in God, which brings us into the right relationship with God. Now, the remainder of this chapter, embrace yourself because it gets strange, arises from Abram's belief in God. Once again, God responds to Abram's growth in faith with a reiteration of the covenant. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, Abram's ancestral land, to this land to take possession of it. And once again, Abram demonstrates that being a person of faith does not mean being a person who has no questions to ask of God. Abram said, 
sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So, Abram now believes that God will make him a great nation, but he is not yet convinced about the land part. And to convince him, God reaffirms the covenant once again, but in a strange and dramatic way, a somewhat gory scene involving a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. We are told that Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. As the sun was setting, we read, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. What on earth is going on here? Well, it's a covenant ceremony. Again, bring yourself back almost 4,000 years. And this is how binding agreements were made. The implication of the ceremony is that the one making the promise is saying, in effect, if I break the promise I'm making, may what happened to these animals happen to me. <laughs> it would make for an interesting wedding if we did that, if we did that same thing today. But this is what's happening with this covenant that God is making with Abraham. God is saying, in effect, if I break the promise I'm making, may what happened to these animals happen to me. And God, symbolized by smoke and fire, which are common symbols throughout the Old Testament for the presence of God. Think about the Exodus, where by day God leads with a pillar of cloud or smoke, and at night with a pillar of fire. Or think about uh, on top of Mount Sinai when Moses goes up and there's smoke and there's fire. Or when the temple is being blessed, there's, there's smoke and there's fire. This is how God is symbolized. So God, symbolized by smoke and fire, passes between the pieces. Notice Abram does not pass between the pieces because it's God, not Abram, making the promise. It's a one-way deal. And here's the deal. We read, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, which is incidentally an even greater parcel of land than ever before promised, and a greater extent than has ever actually been held as a territory, even under David and Solomon, or even under Israel to this day. The full extent of the fulfillment of this promise is yet to be realized. Now, this is an odd way, we think, to make a covenant, uh, killing animals, dividing them in two, walking between it. How do we know that this is how covenants were made back then? Because it sounds more like the kind of sacrifices made in the temple than anything else. But this is something different. The temple sacrifices were offerings. This is a covenant ceremony. And we know it is because none other than the prophet Jeremiah talks about this very thing in Jeremiah chapter 34. God, speaking through Jeremiah, is castigating the nation for refusing to free the slaves in their employ as God had commanded. People who say the Bible supports slavery seem to have skipped over all the parts where God repeatedly condemns it. So listen to what God through Jeremiah says as a result of uh, people not freeing the slaves. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So I now proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me. Here comes the part. I will treat like the calf they have cut in two and then walked between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests and all the people of the land who walk between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. Do you see how this passage from Jeremiah is recalling every last aspect of the way in which God has made this covenant with Abraham? Even to the part about the, the bodies becoming food for the birds and wild animals. In, in our passage, Abraham had chased those, those birds away. Well, 
that prophecy of Jeremiah came true as the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem way back in the 580s BC. So you see, these covenant agreements are serious stuff. That's what was going on in this unusual chapter. God is serious about keeping his promise to Abraham. And as a result of God's covenant display, Abraham would not doubt God again. One last thing. In the middle of this whole covenant scene come verses 13 through 16, a description of the years of slavery in Egypt, which follow the Joseph story at the end of Genesis. We're not there yet. This is the period of slavery which would be brought to a close by the events in the life of Moses. We're to understand that the years of slavery in Egypt were not the result of the failure of God to fulfill the covenant, but simply a momentary interruption. In fact, the remainder of Genesis is the story of the unfolding of this covenant. But there are many more hurdles for Abraham to get through before God's plan comes to fruition. Sometimes Abram's plan gets in the way of God's plan, just like with us. But God will bring his plan to fruition nonetheless, just as we pray with us. We'll see you next time for Genesis chapter 16.